Welcome back. We are excited to be joined by Professor Lauren Hall, who is delivering her second and final lecture of the seminar. And that lecture is titled Family, Freedom, and Civil Society. Professor Hall. Thank you. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here again. Um, again, I'm just going to assume that everyone is here somewhere. <laughs> it's a little odd to lecture to, uh, to faceless people. Um, so I am uh, thrilled, as always, to, to do this uh, lecture for uh, the Institute for Human Studies Some, summer seminars. Uh, there's two reasons that I really think um, uh, well, academics in general need to take the family more seriously, but uh, that libertarians in particular need to take the family more seriously. Um, again, for those of you who weren't at the at my Adam Smith lecture, um, uh, I'm a political theorist, and so one of the things that I uh, I started thinking about the family. Um, largely because of its absence in political theory. So there's two reasons that I think the family is really important to study, not just for political theorists, but at least for uh, people who are sort of his interested in the history of ideas, um, and also people who are interested in sort of how humans live together. The first reason is that the family is just so obvious that I feel like we often overlook it. Um, but the reality is that the family is the foundation of human society. Um, when we talk about different kinds of civil associations, uh, the family is often sort of considered a primary association. So this really intimate sphere of uh, family, close friendships, intimate acquaintances. Um, but the family is, is different from friendships and other kinds of uh, relationships because it has this natural and uh, sort of regenerative uh, quality. So it just, it keeps popping up uh, even if you sort of try to uh, whack it down. And I'll talk about a couple examples of that. So there's this really foundational um, thing that we just don't pay that much attention to. And so what actually got me really interested in looking at the family was again, looking at the history of political philosophy broadly was how poorly all of these really amazing people uh, handle the family. Um, so if you look at, for example, John Locke's treatment of the family, I mean, you can go all the way back to Plato, you know, and Plato sort of like, I don't know what to do with the family, right, in, in the Republic, um, the sort of guardians, we have to get rid of the family because the family has all these problematic associations for justice. It, it, uh, it counters justice in really important ways. Um, Locke has to sort of manipulate the family to get it into its, his social contract theory. So like as soon as you reach maturity, you like don't kind of have duties to your family anymore, right? It's, it's just totally consent based. Um, and so essentially what I was seeing when I started to look at all these different thinkers was that nobody had a decent account of what the family actually looks like. Everyone's account of the family was just slightly off in a variety of ways. And it was like you're trying to shove this institution into a, a, a hole that it doesn't actually fit into, right? So the square peg, round hole kind of problem. So, um, so what I started thinking about was, was trying to figure out why that is the case. So why is it that political theorists, um, uh, philosophers, uh, even economists um, just cannot do the family very well? Like, what is it about this? So I came up with a couple sort of, um, uh, a couple sort of theories and I'll give you a rough, uh, some of these themes were, were laid out in, um, in my first book, Family and the Politics of Moderation, where I, I essentially tried to see why it is that the family um, challenges sort of extreme political positions. So what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, two things. The first thing is give you just a really brief sort of rundown about why it is that extreme political positions have a hard time handling the family. And then I'm going to go into why I think libertarians need to care more about the family. So why that that interaction between the family and freedom is so important for um, all of us to think more deeply about. And then hopefully I'll have time at the end to end with some, uh, well, I'll make sure that I have time at the end, to end with some uh, areas that I think we need a lot more research in, especially uh, people who are interested in the ideas of freedom and, um, and free society. So we'll start with um, the, uh, the sort of collectivist tradition and the family. Um, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. So I'm not, you know, this is a good faith 
uh, attempt to lay out um, in particular Marx and Engels. But I do want to make it really clear that um, just like with the libertarianism that I'm going to talk about after this, uh, there's a range of collectivist philosophers and a range of communitarian philosophers who do the family somewhat better. Uh, but I'm using Marx and Engels um, because their positions are so extreme. And I'll do the same uh, for libertarians uh, on the other side. Um, so just be aware that I'm perfectly aware that there's a middle ground. Uh, and that's where I'm going to try to uh, move us. So the collectivist tradition, um, I think the the most obvious people to look at are Marx and Engels, because they're the sort of most um, uh, consistent about the family. And their writings are so clear about why the family is a danger to, uh, in particular, the communist society. So the, the most obvious book uh, in this arena is uh, Engels, um, I think it's 1884, um, The Origin of the Family and Private Property or the origin of family private property in the state. So uh, both Marx and Engels felt really clearly uh, that the family is a serious impediment to social change. And it's a serious impediment to radical revolutionary social change. So one of the major and maybe the most important reasons for that is the multi-generational nature of the family. So you get all these young people who have these revolutionary ideas and all this energy, and then they're hanging out with all these old people and the old people have old ideas. And we've got to figure out how to like get rid of that. Um, and so there, you see this actually in the early Russian um, revolutionary um, documents, you see a lot of um, uh, those early thinkers, uh, when they're talking about how to get this communist society going, um, they advocate for uh, unit generational schooling, right? Get, get the kids away from the adults and then educate them in single age grades so that they can't talk to old people who, who don't get it. Um, and so the multi-generational nature of the family slows down that kind of revolutionary fervor. And Marx and Engels saw that as a serious structural problem to getting actual social change. The second thing, and this is maybe the biggest, is that the family is intimately linked to private property in two fundamental ways. So the first is that the family is the impetus to own stuff. So when you think about um, uh, why people own possessions or why people want to own things, um, one reason is just to like enjoy them without like other people mucking them up. But another reason is to provide resources for your children, to provide for your family. Um, so when you look at, for example, the way that inheritance operates, uh, the vast majority of people have actually done studies on wills. And the vast majority of people leave their money to their closest relatives. And you can actually predict um, people's relatedness uh, based on who they leave their money to. So you tend to leave most of your money to the people who are very closely related to you and then less, a little bit less of your money to extended relatives and then even less to people that you know, you're not related to at all. Um, so Marx and Engels saw this as a serious problem. So the family generates the desire for private property, but then it also continues the institution of private property because people leave their private property to their children, and that increases inequality over time. So if we want a purely egalitarian system, you've got to get rid of the family because the family is what makes us want to own stuff. Another reason that they were really concerned about the family is that the family's hierarchical. So uh, if you want a purely egalitarian society, having a family, and, and in particular, the kind of family that they're looking at in the 1800s, which is this very patriarchal, hierarchical family structure, um, where you have, you know, the father and, and maybe the mother who have this sort of uh, serious control over their children. And notice how that links back into property, right? So the hierarchical nature of the family is enforced by the property that you hope your parents are going to leave to you. So if you don't do what your parents uh, want you to do, you don't get to inherit their property. So it's another element of hierarchical control over individuals. So Marx and Engels thought that's bad, right? We, if we're going to have a truly egalitarian society, we got to get rid of this, this hierarchical family structure. Um, and, and, and they linked the, the nuclear family in particular um, to the sort of bourgeois capitalist system. So they believed it was just a social construct. And all we need to do is manipulate the economic system in order to get rid of the family in its current form and get something like um, what I'll talk about in just a second of the more sort of egalitarian, communitarian um, family that, that is much, much um, different from the kind of biological ties that, that they were so concerned about. 
Another concern, of course, is that when you're trying to get everyone to pull their resources and their labor and their affections into the collective, right, to care more about the group than they do about their individual self-interest, the family is a fracturing uh, power. It's a fracturing um, uh, institution. And so it pulls people's affections away from the group and back into the private sphere. So they thought that was really dangerous. Um, again, if you want to have this communal society where everyone is sort of pulling in tandem toward this common goal, you can't have this powerful source of self-interest pulling people back into the private sphere again. And so one of the things that, that both Marx and Engels are, are trying to do is to sort of eradicate the private sphere, right, in the sense that the private sphere provides this really powerful counter pull to the public sphere, which is where they want all sort of human endeavor to be uh, to be aimed at. And then finally, and of course, this is linked to all these other things, uh, the family is a source of inequality. Uh, some families are better than other families at being uh, stable, at raising um, uh, sort of autonomous individuals. Um, some families have more wealth as a result of the capitalist system, and then they pass that wealth on to their children. Um, you get the, the, the perpetuation of private property in families leads to growing inequality, they thought, over time. Uh, and so for them, it was just a, it, it was, it was the institution at the heart of sort of capitalist inequality. So you needed to do something about this, and you needed to do something pretty drastic. So uh, leaving aside Marx and Engels, uh, one of the drastic things that people tried to do when they were doing some of the early kinds of um, egalitarian um, uh, experiments, and yes, this was like just an excuse to put a picture of naked babies on um, on the uh, screen. Um, but this is actually, a, it, there's a historical point here. Um, this is actually a picture of uh, babies in an Israeli kibbutzim, so in the early, uh, the early 20th century. So you had um, essentially uh, settlers coming into uh, Israel and they were very much animated by these principles of radical egalitarianism, radical communism, but it was sort of anarcho-communism. So it was, it was communism within small voluntary communities. And there's a reason that that's an important element because we don't have the same problem of force um, in the kibbutzim that you do if you're like looking at, for example, the, the family in Soviet Russia or something. Um, so these are voluntary communities. These are communities where um, people are coming together to live according to strict egalitarianism. So the first generation of, um, of the kibbutzim uh, goes pretty like sort of along the, the Marx-Engels line. Uh, the family's bad, it's hierarchical, it does all these bad things. So what we're going to do is we're going to take children away from their parents when they hit six months old and have them raised in these uh, sort of communal daycares. And you, you might know who your parents are, but um, displays of affection, any kind of bonding was very, very frowned upon. And the idea was, let's let's destroy the, so the social construct of the family and instead replace it with this new communal uh, village sort of love of the, of the community itself. So that was the first generation. Then something really interesting happens. And the really interesting thing happens in the second generation. So these are the children who were raised in these communal daycares. Um, they were raised by the community and uh, grew up as kibbuzniks. They'd never, they had nev never known anything else. So what happens in that second generation, and it starts with the women, and there's a bunch of reasons that we can maybe talk about in the Q&A that that might happen. Um, but it turns out that uh, many women who are, were of this first generation who are now, again, the second generation, they're having children of their own, um, they don't want to give their kids up. They actually kind of like their babies and they don't want to stick them in a nursery. And they actually, many of them in interviews, discuss the fact that they found the daycare um, experience kind of painful. And then for them to have to give their own children up to that was in fact really painful to them. So there were a few reforms that were sort of partial reforms. One was called the hour of love. And so mothers would be allowed to go to the communal nursery and hold their children and play with them for an hour a day. Well, it turns out that if you let mothers have a little bit of time with their babies, they want more time with their babies. Now there's a point at which as a mother that uh, flips. Uh, but for at least this situation, um, the mothers had an hour with their babies every day and they wanted more time with their kids. And fathers started saying, yeah, I would actually like to see my, my child more. Now, this threatened a couple really important things. First, it threatened this whole idea of everyone being equally sort of attached to each other. 
but it also threatened the lack of private property, which the, kib uh, the kibbutzim were, was uh, based off of. So the problem with moving the family back in, in some capacity, is that then you've got to make room for that family. And so the original kibbutzim, everything was communal. So the kit, there was a big communal kitchen and a big communal eating place. And essentially the only thing that you had in private was a bedroom. Well, if you want to bring kids into the home, then kids need stuff. They all of a sudden need a room. And all of a sudden, the, kibbutz, uh, the kibbutzniks were saying, well, maybe we need like a living room so that we can kind of play with our family in the afternoon when we're not working. And the initial, the, sort of the older, uh, more radical uh, generation was just horrified, right? That we were, were giving up exactly what we had fought to get rid of, right? We're reintroducing the family and it's, and it's all of its bourgeois glory. So what ends up happening, of course, over time is that uh, the kibbutzim move from being this radical egalitarian experiment to being, you know, kind of like a sort of capitalist farm share. Um, and uh, most of them are sort of tourist, uh, um, tourist destinations now. Um, they're still working farms, but people go there to work on them. But they're not, they lost that radical egalitarianism in large part because the family reemerged, it reasserted itself. And so that I think indicates something really interesting about the family, uh, which is that maybe it's not just a social construct that you can kind of wipe away when it's, when it's inconvenient. And, and maybe there's a kind of tension with collectivist thought that will f the family will moderate the most extreme versions of collectivism and start pulling people more toward the middle. Now that doesn't mean that libertarians get off easy because libertarians have the exact same problem with misunderstanding the family that collectivists like Marx and Engels have. So I'm choosing to, and again, I'm choosing uh, folks who are by definition sort of radical versions of this thought because I wanna show how the family sort of tends to moderate um, both sides of the aisle. So here I have uh, Ayn Rand and uh, Murray Rothbard and um, for Rand, and I, I, I'm looking primarily at her work, Atlas Shrugged, because she saw that as kind of her magnum opus in a variety of ways. And also because Atlas Shrugged is a fascinating novel to read from the perspective of the family. Um, every family in Atlas Shrugged sucks. Uh, they're all parasites. Um, everyone's relatives are just like manipulating them or living off of them. There's only like one happy family in the gulch somewhere. Um, and we only meet them like once and then they're gone, right? So everyone else just has terrible family lives. Um, and so Rand has a really hard time dealing with the family for a couple obvious reasons. The first is that Atlas Shrugged is based off this traitor morality, um, where it's a bunch of rational individuals voluntarily trading goods uh, to each other. So it's this, it's, a, it's actually kind of a beautiful vision of reciprocity, right? Um, and so that vision of reciprocity, uh, it doesn't work that well in families. And it doesn't mean that you don't get stuff back, but there isn't a clear kind of reciprocity for a lot of family relationships. Um, I have three young children. Um, I, uh, yesterday I literally scrubbed uh, poop out of the upstairs carpet. Um, and my three-year-old didn't trade anything. There was no reciprocity there, right? She just continues to exist. So th the problem with, with Rand's sort of rational reciprocity as being the sort of perfect example of a human relationship is that there's all of these human relationships that mean a lot to a lot of people that don't meet that standard. Now you could say like over the course of a human life, like your children give back to you in all sorts of ways, but it isn't that perfect kind of rational reciprocity that Rand was really pushing for in her, in her human relationships. Um, and part of that is because love is just not based on rational reciprocal trade alone. Um, we love a lot of complicated people. We love people who, if we actually didn't know them, maybe we wouldn't like them. Uh, there's all sorts of people that we're bonded to in our families that we probably wouldn't get along with and maybe would choose not to associate with if they weren't members of our families. And yet we can still feel love for them. We can still feel duty toward them. Um, even if we don't think that they're great people sometimes, or they just have personalities that, that conflict with ours. So love is just, you know, what Rand wants to do 
is base love on this rational reciprocal trade. Uh, and that's just not how it operates, especially in the family, especially when you're talking about um, parents and children and siblings. Uh, those relationships are much, much more complicated than anything like rational reciprocal trade can, can provide. The other thing that Rand is going to struggle with uh, is that the family is radically subjective. So she wants this, this objective nature of sort of human relationships, right? All relationships are based on this kind of objectivity. This is where we get, at least in part, this concept of objectivism. And the idea of these, these extremely rational uh, relationships based on um, mutual respect and, uh, uh, and, like I said, reciprocity. Well, I don't know. That's just not how the family operates. So uh, I have three kids. I love my kids more than random strangers' kids. Um, are those random strangers' kids maybe more worth loving than my kids? Yeah, maybe. Uh, they might be better behaved. They might be smarter. They might be cuter. Um, but I, I love my kids because they are my kids. So it's, it's radically subjective. And uh, Rand is going to push back against that. She wants, she wants there to be rational reasons behind human relationships. And of course, there just aren't for a lot of people. Going on that same theme, the family is an unchosen bond. And so again, when, when, um, when, Rand talks about all these families or has all these families in Atlas Shrugged, all of them are these unchosen bonds and they're horrible, right? They're, again, all these like parasitic people that are just anchors on these, uh, these heroic uh, capitalists. Um, and of course, the truth is somewhere in between, right? There are a lot of people that, uh, that we would probably choose not to be related to if we could. Um, but there's also a kind of importance about that unchosen bond, the fact that you don't always get to choose the people that you love. Uh, and sometimes we're forced to live with and care about people who disagree with us or people who have different views from us. And there's a kind of importance to that unchosen nature. But for Rand, that's a problem, right? Because everything needs to be based on rational consent. And again, that's just not how most families operate. So Rothbard is kind of similar in the sense that I think he, he tries to grapple with the family, but, but really struggles to do it um, in, a, in a deep kind of way. So, Examples that, that, um, that I was thinking about when I first ran across what Rothbard's work is um, his basic definition of crime as harm to one's person or property. Okay, well, so let's take a thought experiment. Uh, say that somebody kidnaps my uh, infant, who's like six, week, uh, six months old, um, carries my infant away, and then raises that child in a wonderful environment. So uh, they have everything they've ever asked for. They have loving parents, probably provide, could provide a better life than, uh, than I could. Um, and so on Rothbard's account, no one was harmed. And so there was no harm to my person or to my property. And so kidnapping in that sense wouldn't be a crime on Rothbard's account. But of course, I think we all recognize that the harm of ripping a child away from a parent is probably one of the worst things that you can do to that person. And so if that doesn't, if, th if that doesn't uh, rise to the level of a harm or a crime on Rothbard's account, I think we're missing something. Now, there are libertarians who argue for what we call a uh, pro uh, proprietarian kind of approach to family, where they would say, well, the child actually is your property um, until a certain point. And so stealing the child is like stealing your property. But I think we all really understand that there's something fundamentally different about stealing a child versus stealing a car, right? There's just a dramatically different kind of uh, crime involved and, and a different type of harm involved. So I think Rothbard really kind of misses that, or, or I don't think he misses it. He just can't adequately account for how the family enters into a radical individualism in this way. Because what the family does is it challenges individualism. It, it forces us out of our individual shell and bonds us intimately to other people in a very, very complicated way. So the second uh, thing that I think most people would sort of scratch their heads at when they look at Rothbard's uh, discussions of the family um, is the idea that parents have no positive obligations to their children. So his solution to things like abuse and neglect um, is baby markets, right? So uh, you, if you don't like your baby anymore, you don't want to take care of your baby, you just sell the baby. Um, or find someone, other people talk about homesteading the baby, right? So find someone to take care of the baby and then your, your positive obligations are done. 
And again, I think that this is just more complicated than, uh, especially when you start looking at human biology and human development, it's just not that easy, right? So it would be nice if like every time somebody got sick of a child, they could just like sort of sell the child to a loving family. Um, unfortunately, what we know about human development is that human morality, uh, there's a critical period between ages about six months to three years. And that period of development is absolutely crucial for the development of trust and the, the development of the moral sense and the moral centers in the brain. So if you have a baby who's just sort of passed around from different people to different people, even if those people are well-meaning, uh, you are gonna fundamentally harm that person's ability to become an autonomous, moral member of society moving forward. It doesn't mean they won't be able to do it, but it's gonna make it much, much harder for them to do so. So again, it, this is this problem of the, the libertarian solution of baby markets needs to take into account the kind of animal that humans are. And the problem, and this is, I think, what both Marx and Rand and Rothbard struggle with, is that they don't have an adequate or a full understanding of human nature. We are, in fact, I mean, I think individualism is, is incredibly important. Um, I consider myself an individualist, but humans as a species are social individualists. We have to live together in order for our individuality to to flourish. And so the family is where that starts. And especially in early childhood development, you just, you have to have a solid, stable bond with a caregiver. Doesn't really matter who that caregiver is in a lot of ways. Um, you can't just sort of have people passing babies off to each other. So I think both collectivists and libertarians sort of struggle with this, with the reality of human nature and the reality of what humans need. So what I'm gonna sort of shift into is why we need to think more seriously about the family from a libertarian perspective. And so there's two things that I wanna sort of focus on. And one of which is, it's certainly true that the family challenges freedom, but the family also supports freedom in important kinds of ways. And so it's a matter of trade-offs. Um, it's easy for Rand to say, you know what, we're only gonna have sort of relatives in spirit, right? Our chosen relatives, people who, who we rationally agree with on everything. Um, but the reality is that most people live in a different world than the world that Rand wants to create. And so then the question is, well, how do we as libertarians um, adapt to or deal with the challenges that the family provides. So I'll give a couple examples and then I'll go to, um, to a discussion of sort of how the family supports uh, freedom. So one is this, is this challenge, this uh, emphasis on rationality. Um, the family is a motive. Uh, again, there's this kind of, now I think rationality is really important um, when it comes to raising children. I think you have to think about it seriously, um, but you can't raise children just in a purely rational kind of way. Um, and in fact, a lot of the research, um, and again, we'll, we'll see sort of how much of this is borne out over time. A lot of the research on parenting, for example, uh, demonstrates that uh, the best parents um, are what they call authoritative, which is a combination of sort of having rational boundaries that they protect, but also being extremely emotionally available to their children. And so that combination of reason and emotion uh, seems to be really important for normal childhood development. And Smith actually, I think, would, would see this as well. I mean, this is where that, that um, importance of sympathy uh, comes in. It also challenges free will. So this idea of sort of bootstraps that you sometimes see in the, the libertarian literature, right? That, that uh, everyone's a rugged individualist and you just need to, to sort of, you know, pick yourself up um, uh, by your bootstraps and do whatever you need to do. Well, yeah, sort of, but humans as a species have the longest period of, of dependence, of, uh, of childhood dependence of any species, uh, certainly in the primate world. Um, we, we, ha we are needy and we are dependent for a very, very long time. And so it's actually not enough to just say like, hey, people should just be able to take care of themselves, especially if people come from very, very damaging childhoods. So there's this problem of how the family challenges our understanding of free will and our, and our understanding of how to be independent from one another. Um, the other one that, that I think we'll, we'll I'll talk about very briefly at the end is this problem of consent. So the family is non-chosen in a really important way. Um, I didn't choose the specific kids that I had. I just, they accidentally showed up. 
Um, I didn't, they certainly didn't choose to have me as a mother. They didn't choose to have my husband as a father. Uh, it's possible that they look around now and they're like, I would have preferred those guys. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how it works. So consent is, is sort of meaningless when we talk about family relationships until you get to be older and then you can, you know, choose to divorce your parents if you want and all of that kind of stuff. But the reality is we're still tethered to these people that we just probably in most cases might not have wanted to be tethered to. But again, I think there's a kind of importance to that unchosenness that, that still challenges this concept of consent, uh, at least in terms of how many libertarians talk about it. Um, the other thing is that the family is inherently a collective uh, enterprise. So at the same time that Marx criticized the family because it's hierarchical, uh, libertarians can criticize the family because it's literally a communist society. So when I wake up in the morning, um, I don't look at my three-year-old and say, well, all right, you want breakfast? What have you done for me today? Because the answer is going to mean nothing. Uh, Three-year-olds do nothing useful or helpful. And in fact, they just scream a lot. So the actual family structure is much more similar to from each according to his ability to each according to her need, right? It's classic Marxism. And so from, from a libertarian perspective, there's a real sort of falling down where, well, wait, all these rules that we have in the broader society don't apply in this weird relationship called the family. So that's a problem. Then, of course, finally, and this goes back to this issue of sort of consent, is that genetics and childhood experiences strongly affect who we, who we become and whether we can become autonomous individuals. So again, the idea of sort of self-created individuals that Rand wants to emphasize is just not what we know about human life. And then finally, and this one's really hard, is that some families are more self-sustaining than others and certain kinds of families are gonna need more support from the community and maybe even from government. So in the book, I talk about different kinds of family forms. Um, uh, for example, uh, single motherhood, dual polygamy, polyamory. And the reality is that there's trade-offs to all of those forms of families. Oh, extended families, I'll throw that one in there. Um, each of them have strengths and each of them have limits. Um, all of them have a variety of, of trade-offs in terms of human freedom and, uh, and consent, but also economic sufficiency and, and independence. So these are all things that I think make the family difficult for libertarians to deal with. At the same time, the family also supports freedom in really important kinds of ways. So um, I mentioned this before, but it balances our reasons and our, our reason and our emotions. So to think back to the Adam Smith's discussion, uh, the impartial spectator that we all work on every day starts in the family. Uh, I watch my three-year-old and she watches her older sisters and she learns what's acceptable behavior and what's not acceptable behavior. She's constantly, even at a very young age, modulating herself to fit the society that she finds herself in. Um, and so that's this constant, and, and again, it's easier to do that. And I think Smith mentions this too. It's easier to do that in a society where people feel sympathy for you because you can fall down and they will help you back up again. So you can make mistakes in the family and there's a kind of patience and a, and a love and an affection that ties you together even when you're screwing up. But that impartial spectator really starts at a very early age and it starts in families first and then moves outward. Uh, it creates affections for the community, which I think is really important. Um, I, I, there's a real problem I think that we can get into in terms of having blind affection for the community, right? The kind of blind patriotism that I think a lot of libertarians are um, very uh, rightly skeptical of. But you do need a certain kind of affection for your community to support the voluntary obedience to legitimate law. Uh, you want to care about the people that you live with. You want to care about the self-sustaining nature of your community. And if every if everybody just sits around thinking like rationally, like, well, does this law, you know, is this law in my self-interest? Um, you're not going to have a community. You're going to have something very, very different. And again, the family helps to create those kinds of affections. Um, and this is this goes back to this childhood development piece that I mentioned. Um, the family, in the best case. In the worst case, it does horrible things. But in the best case, the family creates trusting individuals who are primed to cooperate with each other. So I mentioned that crucial sort of moral development period from around six months to about three years. Um, that's really when kids take cues from their, their society, their, their impartial spectator is looking out and saying, is this a society in which most people are trustworthy? Or is this a society in which most people are violent or most people uh, are, 
um, indifferent. And, and children modulate their own reactions to the communities that they find themselves in. And so a good family, a loving family, is going to have, it's going to be easier to create these healthy, autonomous individuals who are primed to cooperate with each other um, if you have that kind of stable family background. Uh, from a libertarian perspective, the fact that the family supports private property is a feature and not a bug. If you're a Marxist, it's a bug and not a feature. So it supports private property. It encourages the um, uh, people to invest in the future. It encourages people to invest in the future past when they will die, which is a pretty important thing um, if you want the kind of economic growth that continues over the course of uh, more than a couple uh, years. And then I have some others that I'm actually going to, I think these are a little bit less important. Um, I talk about these elsewhere, uh, but I'll just mention them very briefly. Um, I also think that the family does serve an important purpose in sort of moderating extreme uh, political views. And I talked very briefly about the sort of collectivism and individualism, but we can bring these back up in the Q&A if people, uh, people want to talk about them. Um, but I want to end with uh, two last sort of discussions, uh, which is that I think when you actually look at it, you have essentially two libertarian approaches to the family. There's the sort of Rand Rothbard approach, which is let's run the family on libertarian principles, which means you have this really weird um, kind of uh, maybe unhealthy understanding of the of the family where like, you know, you're radically consenting to these uh, relationship with your three-year-old and, you know, maybe selling your baby on a baby market or whatever. Um, there's a, a website called the Libertarian Homeschooler. Um, I actually like a lot of their stuff, uh, actually the Facebook group, but um, I think they, they see, they argue that the family should run on libertarian principles, right? So everyone should consent to all the decisions that the family makes and all these other kinds of things. Um, then there's a more moderate approach, which you find in the work of Friedrich Hayek and uh, Steve Horowitz and myself. And that's accepting that we live in two worlds at once. So, and this is also very much linked to the Adam Smith talk from yesterday, which is we have this world of sympathetic attachments and, uh, and affectionate relationships and the rules there are just different than they are in the wider anonymous society. So Marxism kind of works okay in the family. Um, now it doesn't when your kids are like 18 and you're still giving them everything that they want and you're not expecting anything in return, right? So there's a kind of shift where you shift from Marxism to maybe libertarianism as kids get older. Um, but the idea is that the, the principles of classical liberalism or the principles of libertarianism can't apply uh, to the family in, in their pure forms. And so instead what we do is we accept that we live in two worlds at once, the intimate private sphere of these affectionate relationships, and then the broader market society where free market principles and competition and all of these other wonderful things, division of labor, um, those animate the kind of self-interest that provide flourishing and provide, um, uh, provide uh, wealth on Adam Smith's terms. So these are, I think, the two two potential libertarian approaches. Uh, there's a lot more nuance, and I think they're starting to be more and more libertarian theorists who are interested in these questions of the family. And I can talk about a couple of them um, on the next slide. So what I'll end with is some of the areas that I think libertarians need to pay more attention to um, when it comes to uh, how to flesh out a true to life uh, libertarianism or classical liberalism that takes into account the family as it really exists. So the really obvious one is uh, questions of abuse and neglect. When should the state step in? Um, we, we certainly know that uh, one of the, the legitimate functions of the state for most people uh, is to prevent force and fraud. So how do you do that with kids? Um, there are a couple libertarians, Andrew Jason Cohen, for example, who uh, has written some stuff on parental licensing. So he says, look, this is like the most important thing that you're going to do in your life is being a parent. Uh, let's, people should pass a minimal test, right? Like if you're, if you're addicted to heroin and you cannot stop using it, well, maybe we try to get you some support, but you don't get to raise your child until you are actually clean. Um, and his, his licensing is very minimal, right? It's just to make sure that uh, these people aren't, you know, psychopaths or just incapacitated in some way. But part of his argument is that libertarians have to realize that in order for people to become the autonomous individuals that libertarians care about, They've got to have healthy family life first. And so we need to figure out some way of, of making sure that parents are up to the task. 
Um, questions about single parenthood and the welfare state. So um, how to support uh, vulnerable family structures, uh, given the fact that we believe that as libertarians that reproduction is in fact a foundational right. Um, I think we need more discussion about what kind of right reproduction is. Um, but then looking at the ways in which the there might be roles for not necessarily the community, um, well, not necessarily the state, but maybe the community, um, to interact with uh, families that might need more support. Uh, and then, of course, looking at the way in which the welfare state um, uh, incentivizes specific kinds of families. So, for example, there's a, there's a sort of marriage penalty in a lot of welfare programs that disincentivizes uh, marriages. And there's, again, a lot of sort of nuance in whether those, those kinds of policies are, are good or bad. Um, questions of changing family forms. So polygamy, polyamory, um, other kinds of family forms uh, that are less traditional in our society. Um, we've started to see dramatic changes, for example, in a uh, larger number of same-sex couples having children, adopting children, uh, using surrogates to uh, have children. And so just trying to think more clearly about what kinds of rights and duties uh, all of those different kinds of family forms create. Reproductive technologies. Um, we uh, now have the ability to, uh, for example, I, I mentioned surrogacy. Uh, we have the ability to do various kinds of genetic diagnosis before people use, for example, IVF. Um, we can actually manipulate the genome of our offspring um, in, in some really important kinds of ways. And so we're gonna have to think really clearly about how that implicates consent. Um, if I genetically modify my kids before I implant them in my uterus, um, have they consented to that medical procedure? Uh, do I just trust a kind of stewardship approach that the, it's in the best interest of the child in some way? Uh, we need to hash some of these issues out. Uh, the question of who's a parent and how we define parenthood. Um, so this gets into questions of adoption and fostering. Um, there's a lot of criticism of the current adoption market, which is that it's very difficult to get kids out of abusive and neglectful house, uh, homes and into stable homes. And if we could find a way to incentivize people um, without creating perverse incentives uh, to get people to take care of children um, when their biological parents or whoever is not adequately taking care of them. Um, but there's a big question about sort of how, like how does one become a parent in the first place? Um, right now there's just a legal document, um, but there might be lots and lots of ways that people become parents uh, that don't involve giving birth or donating sperm or whatever. Um, questions of abortion and fetal personhood are obviously sort of in this genre, so questions about when a fetus becomes a, a rights-bearing individual um, is certainly something that libertarians can disagree on. And then finally, I think there's a fascinating conversation going on or starting to happen um, about the question of sort of how we take the libertarian insistence on consent into something as basic as deciding whether to bring a new human being into the world. So none of my kids consented to be born, right? I made that decision for them. And it's possible, I actually, I err on the optimistic side about what the future looks like, but it's possible that with climate change and global pandemics and uh, murder hornets, that my kids would not choose to have been brought into this world. And so I've made this almost irrevocable decision for them. And now they're sort of stuck here. Um, and so there's, there's a question in terms of this uh, pro-natalism pro is like have more kids, the Brian Kaplan uh, kind of approach. But then there's also, I think, an interesting argument on the other side, which is uh, we're making really profound decisions for other human beings that they have no say in. And so is there a kind of philosophic question about, what it, about whether parenthood itself should be a more weighty kind of moral question than it often is. So I will leave us there, um, and I think we're going to break out uh, into breakout groups. But I also want to say, I know we have a kind of rapid fire uh, Q&A coming up, um, but I want to say that I will be at dinner tonight too. Uh, and so I'm very happy to answer any questions that people have that don't get answered during the, during the Q&A. Um, but I will leave you with this beautiful drawing uh, from my preschooler. It's a picture of me. So the first question, do you think our modern understanding of the family is still hierarchical in nature? Um, no. Um, and I, I think that's changing in a couple important ways. Um, we're clearly rejecting the patriarchal sort of foundations of the family, right? Where you have a, a the um, 
father as sort of the uh, the hierarchical head of the household. So that's clearly shifting um, in a variety of ways. And I think a lot of that comes from the shift toward what we call companionate marriage. So for a long time, uh, marriage was primarily an economic contract. It, there was very little sort of um, uh, emotional weight to the decision at all. And now the emotional decision or the emotional weight is, is most of the decision. So um, there's a real shift there then in how the partners sort of view each other. Um, and I think we are also shifting away from the, the hierarchical nature of it when it comes to parenting. Um, and uh, I think that's both a good thing and a bad thing in some ways. We can sort of talk about some of the trade-offs there. Um, but it's certainly true that parents nowadays are more likely to see themselves as friends um, as opposed to that sort of um, stern authority figure that that characterized, um, you know, parenting in the 50s. Do you think that patriarchal or matriarchal family structures are compatible at all with liberalism? Um, yeah. So the good news is that there's a lot of different family forms that are compatible with liberalism. Um, the I think the biggest limitations are the obvious moral limitations that I think are are you know most political theories I think would or political ideologies would um, you know force and fraud are bad uh, they're bad in the public sphere they're bad in the private sphere so um, families that partake in force and fraud are not good families sort of across the board um, but I don't think there's any strong preference for I mean part of what I've argued in, in other places is you're going to have in a polycentric kind of system, um, a liberal system, you're going to have a lot of different family forms, right? So you're going to have like very strict patriarchal Christian covenant marriage. Um, and then you're going to have uh, same sex marriages. And then you're going to have like maybe renewable contract, like, you know, five year marriages where like every five years you like get together as a couple, like, do I still want to be married to you? Um, you could have polyamorous marriages. So, I don't think any of those are fundamentally un, um, incompatible with liberalism. I do have some concerns about um, certain types of family forms if they become too widespread. So for example, um, there's a lot of, Montesquieu talks about polygamy, for example, and, and his concerns about uh, patriarchal polygamy uh, meaning one uh, polygyny, meaning one man with multiple wives, um, that does seem to have pretty illiberal consequences if enough people practice it. But the classical liberal response will be in a dynamic market society, uh, not many people are going to want to practice it because a, it's really expensive. Um, it's just, there's like all sorts of trade-offs and drawbacks to that kind of polygamy. So that would be my only sort of like certain family forms, if they become too widespread, could become problematic for liberalism. But those family forms are less common in liberal societies. So you don't have to worry about them as much. Speaking of Montesquieu, uh, could you touch on how Montesquieu and Burke's conceptions of moderation might help us better understand the family? Yeah, so, uh, well, I think so. Um, <laughs> both of them, I think, have a, uh, both Montesquieu and Burke, um, and this is what I like about the classical liberal tradition in general, uh, is that they start with an understanding of human nature. And so the their individualism is not the sort of, um, atomistic at individualism that I think sometimes we fall into of like, you know, just everyone is born and they're separate and equal station, right? The, the sort of um, the simplistic understanding of Locke or something like that. Um, both of them see humans as being dynamically and even radically social. And so the only way that our individualism means anything is within social communities. Um, you know, you get the, like the occasional guy who like wants to live in a shack in Montana or something, but the vast majority of people, their individualism is protected by dynamic social relationships. Um, and so both Burke and Montesquieu emphasize, I think, that part of uh, the importance of, uh, of community um, and the importance of family. So, you know, again, Montesquieu talks a lot about um, about polygamy and how it sort of corrupts the natural affections that people should have in the family. Um, and Burke talks a lot about the, the uh, it, what he calls the intergenerational compact. And so the way in which our intimate connections with each other and our property and all of these other institutions that stretch across generations moderate our political views. Um, so if you have no skin in the game, it's really easy to be a radical. 
But if you have people that you love and care about and you have property that you're trying to preserve for them and you have uh, sort of something that you want to preserve, you're gonna become more moderate. You're gonna become more conservative in the sense of conserving what is best about your society. Um, and so I think both of them are, are I mean, they're, they're classical liberals, um, but they care very deeply about communities. What role, if any, should the state play in regulating practices that take place within the family? And I think the thrust of the question here deals especially with uh, illiberal practices within the family. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the same standards should apply both in the family and out of the family, right? So if you can't do something to somebody um, uh, outside of the community, then you kind of shouldn't be able to do it to someone in the family either. Um, so I'm thinking about things like, um, I mean, there's hard cases, right? So uh, female genital mutilation is is a hard case because there's different types of female genital mutilation. And so this gets into questions of uh, circumcision, broadly speaking, right? What kinds of things should people be able to do to children before they can consent? Um, so I think those are, those are the hard cases. Um, you know, I think abuse and, and again, neglect are, are sort of, again, they, they're sort of easy to say, but then of course it, it, a lot of this comes down to social norms and the kinds of things that are expected in a community. So I think this is again an area, and I'll keep sort of deferring to Smith here, I think our understanding of propriety is going to be different. So now um, hitting kids is much less socially acceptable than it was, you know, when my parents were growing up. Um, and so you know, do you want the state to step in if a parent, you know, whacks their kid on the butt uh, if they try to run into traffic? Probably not. But if a parent's consistently hitting their child, then maybe you do need some kind of intervention. But one, one mistake that I think we make is that thinking that, that the intervention is removing the child from the home. And in reality, there's a huge array of interventions that the state or the community broadly could take that don't involve removing the child from the people who are probably the most interested in that child's well-being. Is it compatible with liberalism to think that human beings have a positive obligation to start families and populate the earth with more humans? Uh, I mean, well, maybe. Um, not a legally enforceable obligation, so that would clearly be uh, <laughs> um, not compatible with liberalism. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong as a liberal with saying like, hey, humans are kind of cool. Uh, the more humans there are, probably the better off we'll be. We'll get more innovation, more dynamism. We'll have better, we'll have a better life if there are more people. Um, so I don't think anything, I don't think saying, um, you know, it would be good, it's a moral good to have children. I don't think that's incompatible with liberalism. Um, once you start turning it into some kind of, of, you know, obligation that the state can enforce, then of course that becomes uh, inconsistent with liberalism on its face. What are some of the most important moral questions raised by genetic modification and other reproductive technologies? Well, um, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, I think um, the most obvious one at this stage is safety because we just don't know how to do genetic modification um, in most cases safely enough to ensure that uh, there aren't unintended consequences. Uh, we actually have a lot of, if, if, you, if you sort of read the news, you'll think that we're able to do all these kinds of crazy things, but the reality is we still actually don't know how the genome functions. And so even if we identify a specific gene that we wanna target, um, it's much, much more complicated than simply going in and knocking out that gene or inserting a new gene. So I think we're, we're a ways away from being actually able to do genetic modification safely. And I think safety is the primary ethical issue, right? So if you, um, if you do genetic modification um, uh, and then introduce a new form of leukemia, which has happened in gene therapy trials, uh, you've created a harm. You've done something that, that uh, now if the thing that the person was dying of before is worse than leukemia, then there's a trade-off there. But the problem is we just don't know in a lot of cases. So um, I think safety is the most obvious one. Um, I think there are questions of consent. Um, there's a lot of questions right now about, um, 
you know, if we did, for example, find out that there was some sort of gene for, say, homosexuality, uh, would parents be justified in sort of choosing children with specific sexual orientations? Uh, we already use uh, sex selection in almost all in vitro fertilization. Couples have the option to choose the gender of their child. Um, in different countries, it, it, it's it seems to be fairly equal uh, in terms of what people choose. So we don't have like a huge um, bias toward one gender or the other. Uh, but th I think there's there's questions there about sort of what we are what what we are doing with this technology. Um, at the same time, again, I'm I'm a libertarian, so I don't think that there should be hard rules against people using that technology as long as it's safe. The the modification question I think is a is a harder one because you're taking someone's genome that already exists and changing it. Um, and I think that you would have to have some pretty, yeah, these are just, they're hard questions. I think you'd have to demonstrate that, that it's, uh, that it is in fact in the child's interest in some way, um, that you are in fact stewarding for that child. You're trying to make them a more autonomous person than they would have been otherwise. Um, but we're still a ways away from being able to do a lot of that. How do you think that the liberal understanding of the family should adapt to the ongoing digital revolution and changes in the way that we work, uh, maybe work from home? Um, I mean, I think we're going to see really, really dramatic uh, changes in a variety of ways. Um, I think, uh, I mean, one thing I've noticed um, is that parenting is just harder. It's more complicated now that we have this just whole digital world that was not available when I was growing up. Um, so I think there's like much harder questions in terms of how to use your parental authority in a way that is that is legitimate and in fact in your child's best interest. Um, you know, there's questions of, of equity in terms of gender roles. I mean, we one of the things that I, I did a short piece uh, with IHS um, over the summer on what work from home means for women. And, and there's, it's a shoving everyone to a work from home capacity and then having them care for children at the same time. Uh, it turns out that that places a, uh, an, a differential burden on women. Um, and we're seeing that in academic publishing. So uh, women, uh, female academics have, uh, their publishing has dropped over the last couple of months, which is predictable in a variety of ways. Um, so I think, you know, we are gonna, um, yeah, I, there's a ton of different ways that I think the, the family is going to change, um, but uh, those are just the, a couple. And that actually brings us to our last question. It's a nice segue. How can liberalism inform how we think about gender equity within the family? Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a couple, uh, I mean, I'm always going to sort of fall down on the, the side of, of consent, which is, you know, adults can choose a variety of living arrangements that uh, I might not find very, you know, attractive. Um, but people in a in a decent polycentric system, you should be able to sort of choose the the kind of setup that you find most conducive to your happiness. And if that's like a traditional, you know, patriarchal um, covenant marriage, then I, you know, I'm not going to uh, complain about that. Um, I do think that, um, you know, there's, there's real questions about uh, at what age people can consent to, for example, things like marriage to, for example, sexual activity. I don't think we have really good answers for that yet. Um, but I, I do think that liberalism in general tends to imply um, a certain degree of egalitarianism on the part of partners in a in a long-term relationship. Um, and I think this is actually an understudied area within liberalism broadly is, you know, are there certain family structures that, yeah, you just look at it and you say, you know what, the partners are so unequal um, financially, the dependence on, of one on the other is so great uh, emotionally or psychologically that, yeah, it's, it's, consent is not possible and this is on its face an illegitimate relationship. Um, I don't necessarily want the state being sort of the final arbiter of that, but I do think that you can't deny the fact that in intimate relationships, abuse of various kinds is serious and it's a serious concern. It needs to be a serious concern for liberals uh, because that kind of power over other people is just as dangerous as the power that the state can have. 